It's really my honor on behalf of the, uh, the Humanistic Leadership Academy to welcome you. Note that comment at the bottom that uh, you may see an email with an overview video by one of our co-founders, Patrick Struby, which will be available next week. It's about a three-minute video that just talks about um, the vision of HLA and why it's important in the world today. And particularly, it's something that you can share with colleagues or other different places if you want a short synopsis of what that journey really looks like. And so before I turn it over to Otto, I wanna just acknowledge Michael Pearson, who's really been at the heart of bringing the Humanistic Leadership Academy together. Michael, any comment you wanna make about the webinar series about HLA or about Otto before we get started? Well, it's just a wonderful honor and, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Brian, for leading us. Uh, Otto, thank you for taking the time. I see lots of familiar faces. I appreciate you all being here. Um, and I think it's just a wonderful opportunity to reflect together and learn from each other. And, and I would like to put in place an invitation for all of us to just elevate and, and amplify a little bit the kind of work that we are all doing collectively to transform business and business education. I think that this is, this is a, the task of the time uh, and the more we can scale up quicker with partners, uh, I think it will serve us all. So I thank you all for being here. I thank you Otto again and then um, looking forward to, to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Without further ado, Otto, I'm going to turn it over to you. There's no way I could give an introduction that encompasses all the different things that you've been a part of but work in uh, the Presencing Institute via MIT Sloan and the management school there at the intersection of a lot of different things with U-Labs and other things along the way. And we're so excited for you taking the time to share with us this morning. Otto, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Brian. And uh, thank you, um, Michael, for um, uh, inviting me uh, into this uh, series of the Humanistic Leadership Academy uh, it's a great um, uh, honor and privilege and uh, pleasure to, to connecting with you. And what I have in mind to share with you is um, uh, one slide. For that, Brian, I need permissions to, to slide share. Um, and um, what I thought might be most interesting to contemplate is not um, what I have been publishing in the past, um, around theory U, but the foundation for the next book, right? How that whole thing is um, uh, evolving. And um, so as some of you may, may know uh, or um, be familiar with um, uh, somewhat, uh, theory U is really a framework uh, of awareness-based systems change. And um, so it's essentially uh, building on the existing tradition of systems change that came out of MIT and many other places. And what theory you did is that um, below the traditional layers, deeper layers of the iceberg, right? Kind of structures and um, uh, paradigms of thought process and paradigms of thought um, uh, a, a fourth layer, kind of the deepest layer was uh, 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 included, which is the layer of consciousness. So it's, um, it could be also called as uh, consciousness-based systems change. And the two, it can be summarized really if, with two uh, simple principles, which is you cannot change a system unless you change consciousness, um, by which I mean you cannot change a system unless you change the mindsets of the people who are enacting these systems. And that's something I see some of you nodding that many of us have seen, of course, in all the projects we are involved in. And secondly, um, you cannot change consciousness or you cannot change mindsets uh, unless you make a system see and sense itself. So it's kind of really kind of looking into the mirror at the level of the collective, not just kind of with an open mind, but also kind of on a on a heart level. That's really kind of the foundation for unlocking the the potential of collective creativity in any larger system. Now that's basically uh, the, the foundation, I would say. But what I want to share you is um, a slide that I want to use. Uh, to uh, walk you through in the sense of a guided meditation. 
But in this meditation, I'm not um, going to ask you to focus on your breathing to fo or to focus on the feeling of your body uh, or to focus on um, any kind of mantra. But what I'm inviting you to do is to focus on reality. The system's reality we all encounter. That's the most important object of uh, contemplation that in this century mankind has. And um, that's what I want to invite you to. And for that, I am going to begin with a little quote that um, you will know from the context of um, awareness-based systems change one way or another. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. So it's the idea essentially of um, bifurcation points, right? You have one equilibrium, and then when a system is moving out of that equilibrium on its way to a going to another equilibrium in this kind of in-between stage or also referred to as bifurcation point, small differences can have an outsized impact on where the system is going. So that's what he is talking about here. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. So in our present time, there is no shortage on this, um, uh, the chaos part, right, of the middle line. And what I want to invite you into is kind of the, um, to hone in on, in a more intentional way, on the small islands of coherence. I grew up on a farm. And my parents, 65 years ago, uh, when they were young, switched from conventional farming to regenerative farming. So the first 20 years of my life, I was sitting, you know, at our community dinner tables, right? The farm is being now run by a kind of cooperative. And... There was mainly one topic, right? So what is it? What I saw uh, uh, in my father and my parents is kind of, uh, when you're a regenerative farmer, you don't, pest you don't use pesticides, you don't use herbicides. So what's the one source of capital that you have? It's the quality of your soil. So all the attention is about increasing the quality of the soil. So it's kind of what we see below the ground, right? So it's kind of the... That's the less visible part of the field. And then, of course, there's a lot growing uh, more visibly, right, above the ground. So what I learned to understand is kind of that the quality of what's growing above the ground is a function of the quality of the soil that is less or not visible to the eye. And that's really the core idea of systems thinking. That's the core idea of, uh, of the iceberg model, right? You have 10% visible above the waterline. The rest is below the waterline. So I want to now, you know, use this kind of as the guiding image kind of for inviting you into this meditation. So if we take this distinction, the two parts of the field, and when I think about what my parents did, and when I think about what I, you know, what I do now, and I'm like thousands of miles away, um, in a different place, I work in a very different context, but essentially, I'm doing the very same thing. All I do is, in all my work, and I think it's probably the same for most of you, is to increase the quality of the field. Just that in our case, it is the social field, not the field of agriculture. And what is the soil the invisible part of the social field. It is 
the quality of our relationships. It's the quality of our relationships. And that's what I want to invite you to, uh, you know, put your attention on and, uh, uh, you know, uh, follow this kind of guided meditation just a little bit. So what is it we see growing above the ground? All the different sectors and systems, right, that we are all involved in, you know, for all of these sectors are critical for um, our current climate moment, kind of for our current, uh, current biodiversity moment. But what strikes me as an observer is how when I look at the evolution of all these different sectors from a systems view, I see the very same fundamental shifts happening in all of them. And that has to do with an evolution of the inherent operating system from a current model that, you know, I refer to as the 2.0 model, right, which is organized around output and efficiency centric to an emerging new model that is organized around user and stakeholder centric mindsets and ways of organizing to an even more radical new model that is uh, I refer to as 4.0 and which is organized around ecosystem and regeneration centric ways of organizing. Now, what are examples of that? In agriculture and food, we have seen a shift. We are seeing a shift from industrial agriculture, the mother of half of our environmental issues, to sustainable ag. That's better, right? It's, it's kind of less harm, on less negative footprint on the planet. So regenerative agriculture, which is really about kind of the positive impact about food as medium for healing planet and people. When we look at education, we see an evolution from teaching for testing, still the mainstream, right, in uh, most of the uh, educational systems worldwide, to student-centric learning. And from there to uh, learning or education for human flourishing. Uh, a notion of learning that integrates heads, heart, heart, and hand. And um, so just a few weeks ago, we at the Presencing Institute, we are kicking off um, uh, a major project with the OECD educational department with multiple countries involved, edu which is titled kind of education for human flourishing. So the same people that drive everyone crazy with the PISA study, right, that keeps people uh, stuck into this 2.0 now realize that in this century, of course, something very different uh, is needed. Uh, energy from centralized fossil fuel to uh, hybrid to decentralized regenerative uh, energy uh, systems. When we look at the role of sustainability in business, um, you know, sustainability, it started with sustainability in terms of really resource efficiency, uh, uh, improvement, and then ESG and kind of circular and kind of really uh, sustainability as a source of innovation, right? Now we are beginning to rethinking our core business, really. And from there, slowly moving into uh, sustainability, transforming the purpose of, of business business as a force for good. And that's, of course, uh, only very few shining examples that we all know of, but we know kind of that's kind of where we need to go. In finance, it's from extractive um, finance to uh, ESG and impact investing, a step in the right direction. But what we really need is to shift the main bulk of money, which is still stuck in the 2.0, into regenerative finance, by which I mean resources that move into the regeneration of our social, ecological, and cultural commons. Technology would be a whole topic in itself. We needed another hour for that, but let's just say this. Technology is about how to use the power of AI, not only for the benefit of a few uh, billionaires, and um, empire builders kind of in this sphere here, um, but 
uh, for the benefit and the well-being and the creativity of all. Kind of that's kind of the um, underlying question here. And at the end of the day, we all know kind of the uh, acupuncture point number seven in our current transformation um, is what underlies all the above, and that is governance. And here we see an evolution of the traditional mark mechanisms of markets um, and uh, hierarchy uh, to multi-stakeholder processes that many of us are involved. So processes where we begin to act collectively uh, uh, based on a shared awareness. So an example for that, we just have the beginning of the COP would be the Paris Agreement, right? Kind of as an uh, amazing example of uh, operating, of, 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 of acting collectively based on a, on a shared awareness. So what do we see when we look at this whole spectrum here at the Northern Hemisphere of, uh, of this um, system here? We see the sectors, we see uh, a movement from the outer to the inner, but the mainstream still struck, uh, stuck in the 2.0. And as um, the innovators uh, move into the more radical innovation sphere kind of uh, in this inner um, uh, part here, we see that the boundaries between all these sectors begin to collapse. So there is a space of convergence. But why is it we see not more traction, right, into the 4.0? And the answer to that question has to do with the Southern Hemisphere, right, which is the quality of the soil, right, which is what is kind of invisible to the eye, which is... I think what most of us are probably working on, right? The quality, it has to do with management, with leadership, with building different, with shifting the qualities of our interactions. So what do we see here? We see new holding spaces that allow us to shift the qualities of relationships in a variety of key dimensions. Number one, uh, when we start on the personal side, uh, uh, shifting the listening from factual to empathic to uh, generative, so from more shallow to deeper ways of listening, shifting the quality of conversation from debate to dialogue to collective creativity. And then when we come more to the institutional side here, of course, um, leadership kind of from traditional forms like MBO, uh, to more participative form to what Ed Schein has referred to as humble leadership, really kind of um, creating, um, you now leaning into the areas of our not knowing. And in terms of ownership, it is kind of from traditional forms of say public ownership to family ownership and from there to steward ownership, which is really um, uh, uh, focusing the ownership um, on um, on the purpose, right, on, on, on operating enterprises as a force for good. So what I'm really saying here is, at the end of the day, something very simple, which is that the evolution of our sectors and systems can be seen as a manifestation of an evolving human consciousness that moves from ego system awareness, right? This kind of output, this kind of um, uh, old operating system here, operating in silos, to a user and stakeholder awareness, and from there to an ecosystem awareness, by which I mean an awareness of the whole. And as we do that, we move into a space of convergence, which has to do with three fundamental shifts from extraction to regeneration, from ego to eco, by which I mean from a silo type of thinking and operating to a systems way of thinking and operating. And in terms of our acting from reacting against the issues of the past to sensing and operating from emerging future possibilities which is uh, what I mean with the word presence. And as we embody these three principles, we begin perhaps to activate these islands of coherence 
that um, when if connected, really can form ecosystems of coherence and can activate the enormous pos- potential for profound change that many of us are feeling in this current moment. That trajectory towards activating this dormant potential, right, that's sitting kind of in this um, inner circle, kind of where we see this convergence of all these different sectors and also a convergence of what's of the southern and the the northern and the southern hemisphere, right? Kind of the visible and the invisible part of the field. Um, that's one story today. But then there's another story. What's the other story? The other the story has to do with what we have been seeing going on over the past few years. Dark tech, by which I mean the uh, first encounter with uh, AI that we had over the past few years in the form of social media. That has uh, created a trillion dollar industry and also three unintended side effects that are listed here, mass misinformation, mass polarization, and mass depression. Dark money, which is, you know, after the disastrous, I think it was 2010 Supreme Court decision, a major force uh, in US politics, but we see also in other cases, um, together, those two forces have given us this, right? This, um, you know, or have strengthened kind of this trend to autocracy, or in some cases, kakistocracy which is um, uh, the rule of the worst, right? The rule of one or the rule of the worst. Um, Feudal ownership structures, right? Where there is a discussion, is that even capitalism, right? With all the ownerships and the uh, monopolistic platform, if you look into the tech space, is owned by uh, three or four empires. Leadership style, right? More authoritarian, right? We we saw a resurgence of that. Um, so the examples are uh, are not far. Hyper extractive uh, business models, um, as we um, as we, for example, see see in the fossil fuel industry, fracking. Um, when you look into into the energy sector. Right, which is probably the worst form of of generating uh, uh, energy. Recently, uh, you may have seen it. There was a, an interesting uh, commentary in the New York Times um, linking the technology of fracking, which is basically pushing junk with high pressure into uh, the earth to extract what we want to get, kind of the, uh, the the gas and oil, with what's happening in the tech industry, right? pushing a lot of noise, pumping a lot of noise kind of into our system in order to extract the most scarce resource of the in the 21st century economy, which is attention, our attention. So it's kind of the same forces kind of operating here on different dimensions. Um, indoctrination, right, in education and teaching, uh, we all know these examples, ecosystem breakdowns, Listening is degrading to echo chambers, right? Being stuck in our in our uh, tech-enabled echo chambers, uh, silencing and othering, right? So we have kind of uh, uh, think about the whole cancer culture and all the different from from all the different uh, political directions uh, as another major force. So if you look at that whole outer ring, what really is the common denominator? Kind of that all of these dimensions have. And I would say, what is the operating system at work here? And I would call this operating system matrix of manipulation because it's essentially about manipulating human behavior from outside. And that is exactly kind of what this kind of why, why this is a trillion dollar industry because it works. And uh, uh, it is a force in the world, it is real, and that's kind of uh, the second story of um, what is going on today. So current moment, I would say, 
is defined by those two stories, is defined by those two forces, and we are right in the middle thereof. We are kind of leadership in this century means you are dealing with both of these forces, and you are right in the middle. And um, if this is true, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands in a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. So if that's true, the question, of course, is who is the smallest unit of those small islands of coherence? And the answer, in my view, is it's you. It's your own self. It's your own heart, right? That's kind of the, uh, uh, each of us, kind of each leader in this century, each change maker is the smallest islands of coherence. It's the small groups that we form. It's kind of the small kind of enterprises and companies and initiatives. So there are many different versions of that. So when you take a moment now and look into this collective mirror that we see here, ask yourself, what is it? that has most of your attention right now. Which of these sectors in the Northern Hemisphere is it that you are operating in? And it may be, in many cases, more than one. And then when it comes to uh, the Southern Hemisphere, the quality of the soil, the quality of our relationships, what is it? Where do you see your own evolution? And kind of what, where is your main anchor in, in how we listen, kind of how we have conversations with each other, how we engage in leadership in our organizations, how we structure ownership and governance in the systems that we collectively enact. And when we follow that train of thought, and I want to close with that, I would say the main lever leverage point in all these 12 dimensions that you see spelled out in this visual is essentially the same. It is based so as we move from the outer to the inner spheres, the main shift that happens in all of these dimensions is a shift of the locus of attention from which we operate. From an old model where the source and the locus of my attention, where my attention is being sourced from my attention and intention is action and action is being sourced from the center of my own system. So where I'm basically stuck inside my own boundaries. And that's something I call I and me. And as we move into the 2.0 operating system, we begin to source our attention. We begin to source our actions from the periphery of that system by looking out, right? Looking, uh, looking out into the world. And examples here is kind of factual listening, debate, uh, MBO, public ownership. It's a transactional view. It's kind of a subject object view that deals, that actually uh, opens up to what actually is going on around us. But then as we move more into the relational dimension, from the I on it into the I in you, what really happens here is that the source of our attention is originating from outside the boundaries of our own system. So I begin to listen. Empathic listening means my listening is originating from the place from where another person is speaking from. 
dialogue means is that I'm truly moving into other people's perspective. Kind of, I can move around uh, a, a topic, right? While looking at it through multiple stakeholder views. Participative forms of um, leadership really move beyond kind of uh, simply kind of transactional ways of engaging with each other. Family ownership, um, bringing in kind of um, uh, a deeper than just a more kind of transactional short-term perspective that we know from traditional capital markets. And as we move into the inner sphere, uh, we begin to operate from what's emerging from the surrounding sphere, which I call presencing or I in now, right? I in now means connecting a to uh, and operating from what's emerging in the current moment. Generative listening, collective creativity, humble leadership, lean, really leaning into that current moment, and steward ownership and awareness-based collective action are all examples of this way of operating. So that, in my view, is the ultimate leverage point. The ultimate, ultimate leverage point is each and every one of us, how we attend to that system and what the locus of our, the locus of uh, is from which our attention and intention and action is originated, originating from. Whether that's kind of inside, stuck inside our own center, whether it's from our periphery, whether it's from another person's point of view, or whether it is from what is emerging from the surrounding sphere. And that shift from the being stuck inside our own system to really a more deepened relational point of view makes all the difference. So let us just um, close this with a little um, moment of uh, contemplation where I uh, invite you to... Uh, look at you, you know, to use this collective mirror that we see in front of us on the screen as an invitation to looking at our own practice as a systems leader from this evolutionary point of view. Thank you. Otto, I want to thank you for those wonderful comments. You're getting quite a few accolades in the chat and other places as well. Uh, a couple of questions as we move into this time, and we'll continue to encourage people to source questions in the chat. I, I want to start kind of local, and then you gave us such an amazing model, you know, build to the larger. You, you ended talking about that important sense of I, you know, in me, in you, and others. Any direction you would give for those of us on this call as we all look inside of ourselves and reflect on that document of methods or approaches to how we can continue our own progression? Because Al offers specifically, I do not feel that I'm at the center of that diagram yet in my own reflection. Others may or may not feel the same way. Any practices, approaches, books, thoughts that can help us continue our own evolution to be the type of leader that can operate in that 4.0 system. I would say the most um, the most important practice um, from a leadership point of view is uh, the first one that I mentioned: listening. It's the foundation of everything. It's the most unnarrated leadership um, skill and competence. And it's something we all do 16 plus hours a day, one way or another. 
So there is um, ample of opportunity to move out of the first or the first two levels. And it is not that there is a good level and a bad level. That doesn't exist in social science. It doesn't exist in management. There is only levels that are appropriate to a situation and those that are not. And to assessing that is your job as a leader, is your job as an educator. So what this framework does is it's giving you a tool to ask these two basic questions. Number one, what is the level I'm currently operating on? My level of listening. Am I just protecting stuff? So when, um, when you are sitting in a meeting and everything that happens is pretty much exactly what you expected to see, that's when you're on level one. That's when you're downloading. That means, you know, nothing new is entering your mind, right? It's just kind of reconfirming what you already know. And that's, that's not good or bad. It's just kind of one out of four. But if you live in a moment of disruption, of profound change, that one mode, of course, is not enough, right? So... The second one, so how would you know whether or not you move from just reconfirming what you already know to factual listening? And the answer is whether, so our attention on the first level is really pretty much on our internal narrative, right? Kind of we are really, and the moment you forget this and really are 100% attending to what someone uh, uh, sitting next or opposite to you is actually saying kind of that's when you move into number two and often kind of and the result is that we notice something new right we notice something that's unexpected and that's really what you want to tr be training yourself kind of to so if you didn't expect anything new or unexpected you have not been on the second level okay so that's how you would know and then how would I know whether I move to the third level, which is empathic listening? And the answer is, um, if you don't go away from a meeting with truly a new perspective, right, through someone else's eye, kind of that you have been encountering, and through which, at least for a little moment, you forget forgot about your own agenda, kind of forgot about, you know, uh, your own uh, view or take on that, but really put yourself into someone else's shoes, which is the perspective you will take with you afterwards. If you don't have that, and if you just kind of got some new ideas, but you look at these ideas from just your silo view, then you haven't been of uh, on level three so level three is really kind of this uh, this deep dive this kind of putting yourself into someone else's shoes forgetting your own stuff for a little moment right and, and coming away kind of with genuinely um a different perspective that you weren't quite aware of before and how would i so those are the first three they are all very i'm not saying anything new here right so so it has been said in different ways many times that doesn't mean it's done, but you know it has been said before. Um, the only potentially new thing is in all these uh, parts of this uh, sphere that I shared with you, all 12 dimensions, the only new thing is level four. And in, in terms of listening, that is, how would I know whether or not I was on level four? I would say two, two or three things. One is, the level of energy is up, right? And regardless how tired you are, you are fully energized after. Uh, secondly, if you really, and that sounds a little uh, uh, horny or funny, but it's actually kind of a very clear criteria from a first-person view, I would say, is if when you leave a meeting, you are still the same person mm -hmm. you were when you entered that meeting, you have not been on level four. 
because uh, level four means you're no longer the same person. You're just a little more who you really are, right? There's a little shift, a, a shift in which direction, in, in the direction of who you really are. And again, it, it's, it sounds, um, it sounds um, funny, maybe abstract, but it's not abstract, it's subtle. Right, and it's something you will immediately recognize um, when you are in that experience, or just coming out of that experience. So your sense of self has shifted. The sense of identity is kind of somewhat clarifying or intensifying. And the last one, the third criteria, is this, and that's the simplest. Right, it's it's the most tangible, if you want, whether or not something new was born, mm. right? If, if there is something new, boy, so level four means it's an arrival process of something of significance that's beginning to be born that you know in your bones will guide your future path one way or another. So that's really the, the level four. And... Um, it has to do with the essence of our humanity. Now, let's just be clear. I mean, why is it that everyone now talks about education, that even kind of the, uh, the PISA people, right, talk about education for human flourishing? And the answer is very clear, AI. Because everything, what was education so far? Level one, level two, right? Teaching for testing. Well, all that stuff can be done better by AI, either today or tomorrow, or this afternoon, let's put it that way, right? In a few hours, if not already now. That's very clear. So the what is the blind spot of AI? Level four. It's the inner sphere. That's the blind spot. What is the blind spot? It's the future. It's the emerging future. AI is the most brilliant machine you can imagine in analyzing, identifying, and recombining the brilliant, most brilliant things that we have been creating in the past. Its blind spot is the emerging future that deviates from these existing patterns and that deviates from just recombining what already is. And that has to do with the essence of our humanity. Because this is who we are as humans. We have this special relationship to the future. When I talk about the future, I'm not talking about it like the traditional experts, right? 2030, 2050. What is, what is it all these people are talking about? A future in a different place where different people create some results. So it's kind of what happens in a different time, in a different place by different people. No, that's not the future that I saw when I studied entrepreneurs, when I studied innovators. When I studied people who have really created significant innovations in their fields, what I saw is that the future is utmost personal. Because in essence, the future is this. It's a possibility Excellent. I that, thank you so much. Okay, continue. It's a possibility that looks at you because it depends on you in order to manifest. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get more personal. And that's an experience that many entrepreneurs, that many social entrepreneurs, that many innovators have, but don't talk about. It's kind of um, this intimate relationship to a possibility that is not abstract, it's subtle. 
It's very concrete and it's a body of resonance that we can connect with through our heart. And that if connected with can guide us in situations of emergence and in situations of disruption where all the other exterior navigation instruments aren't particularly helpful. Anu, thank you so much for such a great answer. Before I move to another question, I want to invite Dov Snowden-Jones, one of our co-founders, to react. Uh, I did not know that you were going to select listening and the depth that you had there. Um, Dov, what would you like to add in terms of listening and inquiry? Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Otto, for you know being on this uh, and part of our journey here at HLA. Um, so what came up for me with what you were sharing is... Um, it also resonates with the work that we do with the Humanistic Leadership Academy. And we always find when, you know, when we take ourselves out of the equation, we can not, we, you've just distinguished that it all begins with us. Who we're being is the, um, is the beginning of the journey. And it's not egoic in any way, shape or form. We actually let that go. And then we're standing in, in this future. Um, what we've declared for our organization is if you, a world that works to 100% of humanity. When I connect what you've just been sharing with um, the work, the essential work that we do, is if we get that we are the source of it all, uh, that we, we are these small islands of coherence, and then to speculate, what does the world look like in the future? What does the world look like in the future for myself when I'm operating? You know, if we know that... Um, I am the source of change. And we're standing in this future where each and every human that we come into contact with then becomes their own source of change uh, out there in the world and start to stand in that. And so the shift is removing the ego and standing in just being a humanistic leader out there in the world. And um, it, it, there was so much I kind of wanted to connect here, but starting in that that the work that we can take away today would be just to speculate what would it be like for me if i'm being a humanistic leader out there in the world what would it be like for me what would it be like for my students what would it be like for my family when i go home for my community and then for the environment so just to speculate that and then once you've speculated stand there that's possible stand in that possibility um and what will emerge is you know, what we could maybe call our authentic self. We get to discover ourselves newly. Thank you, Dov. Um, Otto, I'm gonna take you to a different place that was back in the chat a little bit. Could you paint a picture? Dov was talking about painting a picture of the kind of educational institution that we'll need in this new conscious. You talked about moving from teaching, <clears throat> teaching to the test, to other different things, but any thoughts about the system of educational institutions and for the deans and professors and others on this call, how it can be part of helping that to emerge? I would say um, all, many of the ingredients are already there, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of these, uh, it's really... Um, what what I'm really talking about is so if you have a more um, holistic framework of uh, you know educating all the intelligence that we have, not just the one that reside above the neck. Um, so also uh, the heart, not as a place of really um, uh, you know sentimentality or emotions, but really as an organ of perception. So picking up data that matter when you're a leader, that matter when you're a change maker, that matter when you um, deal with network leadership challenges with multiple perspectives. Uh, and also the knowledge of what I call open will, or you could say the knowledge of the hand, right? Kind of the, when I look at, for example, at, at MIT uh, and MIT Sloan, I mean, uh, one of the massive changes of the past 20 years really has been not only the the um, the mainstreaming of sustainability but also of action learning right in uh, you know across schools really and that's kind of where 
so the venue of where learning takes place moves off campus, right? I mean, to some degree, it has always been off campus when you look at where do p real people really learn stuff, right? So it's, um, but uh, we can integrate and weave that more into the curriculum, I would say. And that's, all, of course, already, already what many of us are engaged in. But um, I would also say in the classroom, we can do, and I am, for example, also doing very, uh, you know, it is very much possible to create a very different experiences that are extremely valuable and sought after uh, by students. And uh, it is um, uh, based, it does come, um, you know, what you need uh, in terms of physical infrastructure is not kind of the traditional lecture hall with fixed chairs, but really workshop space. So where you can freely move um, between individual, small groups and larger groups, formats and engagements, and we and quickly move back and forth as many of us do, uh, where you ca can bring in lots of practices, right? Kind of that bring in the learning of the hand, kind of that bring in contemplative practices, but that also bring in components of action learning, kind of every... So I think the, the, the currency when we really you know, talk about learning, not just in a horizontal way, right? Adding new kind of technical skills to my portfolio and intellectual skills, but in a vertical way, which is really the capacity to move across 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, up and down as needed by the situation on all these levels of um, uh, are connecting with reality that I spelled out in the Southern Hemisphere, um, a lot of that can practice, uh, can be practiced on campus actually, right? So, so you need workshop space, you need a set of practices, and of course, most importantly, you need faculty who do that, who can do that, right? And um, so that's, um, but I think that's kind of what brings us together here, and that's kind of you have the ingredients for that in every in, in every school. It's just kind of those people are usually isolated, outsiders, not felt, uh, not feeling part of um, the thing maybe. And um, I think uh, if, if I'm a dean, right, I'm in a perfect place of uh, making a difference there. And um, as always, kind of you, you cannot like, uh, you know, top down mandate this kind of change. You need to nurture it. Uh, but the seeds are definitely there. And a key is exactly what we are doing here, which is connecting the people who want or already do work in this direction with each other and make them amplify um, uh, each of their work and each of these practices. Otto, that is the work of the Humanistic Leadership Academy, and we're so thankful for the time today. I see many things in the chat that I would love to get to, but with our time, I've got just one final question for you. And I, I see from the visual reactions, but also the reactions in the chat, uh, many people are so thankful for your, what you shared, the model, the lecture, your personal reflections. How can people stay connected to this thinking? There was a question in the chat about a book. I know you work with the Presencing Institute. Are there other webinars or conferences or things? You just give us a short picture of how people who are um, emboldened and enlightened by today's presentation can continue the work and align to some of what you're doing in the world. So we get those islands of coherence to continue to come together. Yes. Um, so I would say the um, uh, in terms of resources, um, the two things is um, one is um, let me put that uh, maybe into the chat. It's uh, uschool dot org and uh, but let me just um, type that right in here. Uh, there's a mailing list, so that's kind of the first thing, um, a mailing list. Uh, when you enroll in that, you will actually, and then there is uh, my, um, it's just my name, autosharma.com. That's uh, another site where uh, there's a bunch of resources. And um, the 
what I uh, outlined today is the foundation for a new book, which is currently scheduled to come out uh, early 2025. So it's um, any kind of uh, feedback I would uh, appreciate because, uh, frankly, I'm you know uh, it's it's like I'm in a very early stage uh, for that, but uh, it will kind of get on paper in the next um, few months and then into the process and any kind of feedback would be mostly appreciated uh and then i would say just kind of the presencing institute mailing list uh, on the first link the uschool.org uh, um will uh keep you connected and um give you um access to all the resources well, and pretty much everything i do ev everything we share is open source there is um, tools uh, on the uschool.org website that are designed for people like you, right? Kind of they are kind of meant to be used. Um, everything is uh, Creative Commons, and um, that's um, uh, uh, what our, all our work is uh, dedicated to, 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 to democratize access to transformation literacy, which is really the literacy to get into the inner sphere. Anna, thank you so much for those resources, for the open nature of what you're sharing and for all the work. There's been multiple comments, again, about the power of your words today. So we thank you so much for that. To all of our attendees, I wish we would have more time and more opportunities, but this could be the beginning of a continued dialogue between HLA and Otto's work in the Presencing Institute. We're talking more behind the scenes about what can continue. I hope you take at least one piece of inspiration away from today that you can live in your experience whether that's over the next day, week, or month. And we'll continue to invite you to next week's webinar session as well, which is going to focus a bit on how we create care and accountability um, simultaneously together. So thank everybody for the time you spent today, for the work that you do to help uh, the description that Otto described emerge in the world. And Otto, again, thank you so much for your time, your commitment to this work, and your connection today. Thank you all. Yeah.